All right, here we go. Last but not least of our day here, day one of our first ever Minnesota Housing Grants Conference. Uh, welcome. This is the session specific to the homework starts with uh, grant. My name is Mary Many, and I am one of the co um, co managers, co overseers. Um, for this grant along with Diana Lyons, who is with us today, um, and Nancy Urbanski, who is not with us today. Um, she is on a well-deserved vacation. So just starting off here, um, oops, gonna advance my slides, who we are. Minnesota Housing, as you most likely know, uh, we are the state's housing finance agency and for more than 50 years we've worked to provide access to safe, decent and affordable housing and to build stronger communities across the state. We believe that housing is the foundation for success, so we collaborate with individuals, communities and you partners to create, preserve and finance affordable housing, uh, finance housing that is affordable. And this, of course, this supports um, to maintain that housing. Today we will um, share a few resources for you that we think would be helpful in your Homework Starts With Home project. Um, go over the cohort uh, review and kind of so share some stats with you since we are now on round three of Homework Starts With Home. Uh, share a little update from our research partnership and then just end with a few, few updates uh, for you. It's, a short hour, so a lot to uh, touch on in that time. And I invite you to put your name in the chat uh, with your agency and role with Homework Starts With Home. And if you're if you're uh, comfortable, please uh, share your camera at least for a minute. It's really nice to uh, see faces and names. Um, I've been seeing mostly my reflection today since our earlier sessions have been live and haven't had the capacity to uh, have uh, audience members share their cameras or share their voices. So I've, I've looked at myself and I've really been admiring my banner back here. I don't know if you can read it, but it is um, it says this must be the place and it is a line, uh, the title of a talking head song and it's got me thinking a lot about the line in the song that says um, well, I'll spare you my singing voice, but it says home is where I want to be. Um, and it's where I am. It's where a lot of you are right now. And it's where a lot of uh, Minnesotans want to be, unfortunately, and not the case. But it is uh, where a lot of families are finding themselves because of your work and homework starts with home. So I first wanted to say uh, just Thank you so much uh, for the work that you're doing uh, in all of our grant programs, but particularly since we're talking about homework starts with home, I wanted to to say um, my thank you for for your work in uh, engaging with schools and helping those uh, students stay stay housed. So first, want to kick it off with um, sharing some resources that we want to make sure that you're aware of and um, staying in tune with. So uh, Eric is going to, to share about um, homeless prevention local aid and then we'll have uh, Lee chime in. So Eric, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Aaron. And if it's OK with you, what I'll do is share some slides. Yep. All right, let me know, folks, if you're able to see this. Let's see. Hopefully that's popped up for you now. Yep. All right, great. Um, uh, so uh, what I wanted to do, uh, so Eric Grumdell with the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness, and what I wanted to do is just hit a couple of um, uh, pieces of news that uh, one of which is not breaking news, the other of which is a little more in that breaking news category. Uh, just as you're thinking about the reach of your programs and the work that you're doing locally uh, with your partners, and so the way that that positions you, I think, for for the opportunities ahead. Uh, I also want to just uh, being with all of you today just uh, makes me also want to take the opportunity to just encourage you to stay connected uh, to the Interagency Council on Homelessness as you're able. And so if you're not already signed up for our weekly newsletter uh, or don't already participate in our weekly webinars that are really focused on the COVID response, uh, there's information on the screen for how you uh, get signed up for those things. 
Um, the, uh, the, the legislative session uh, for 2022, or at least a legislative session for 2022 kicks off uh, today. And so uh, this is really taking us all the way back to the, the summer uh, last year with the outcomes from the special session, uh, the first special session of 2021. And so the little fuzzy QR code on the screen will give you a, uh, if you hold your camera, your phone camera or whatever at that, it'll give you a, a link you can open and be able to, to see the summary or there's the link at the bottom of the of the screen as well. But the, the key point is just that uh, uh, thanks to a work of a lot of people and uh, legislators and advocates and um, all kinds of partners, there were some really important outcomes from uh, the legislative session uh, last year. And uh, I'm gonna focus specifically on one of them, the 40 million per, per biennium for the local homeless prevention aid. But I wanted to put it in the context of the fact that last year was actually a pretty remarkable uh, legislative year overall, 12 million for ESP, 2 million for additional capital investments in shelters, 26 million for the community living infrastructure grants. So a lot of, uh, a lot of pretty remarkable things, 100 million for housing infrastructure bonds. Um, so then focusing more specifically on this local uh, homeless prevention aid, this was really kind of a novel proposal. And so just wanted to unpack it a little bit. It is fair to say that everything I'm going to share is really drawn from the legislative language. And so there's no real secrets in here. It's, it's more just about providing visibility or a spotlight on uh, some of what uh, the, the funding that was adopted last year includes. First, it's a local government aid, and we don't have a lot of those in our existing kind of portfolio of homeless uh, investments. This is the first that I'm aware of that has really uh, uh, created a, a, an opportunity for us to, to test and experiment with a different way for homeless services to be financed. Local aids really flow to from the state to another jurisdiction, and the other jurisdiction has an incredible amount of latitude and discretion in how those dollars get invested. And so uh, this is an aid that flows to county governments. There's some conversation legislatively happening about whether counties should be the only entity to receive those funds, but that's how it's presently structured. There's a calculated amount that goes to counties and the calculation is based on a combination of factors that includes the county's population and how much student homelessness is identified in that county. There's a minimum amount per county. It's a significant amount of money at $20 million a year, and that's allocated by the Department of Revenue in two installments, one of which flows in December and one of which flows in June. The first, uh, the, the allocation amounts are gonna be announced in August uh, of this year, and then the first payment will flow in December of this year. So there's, <clears throat> there's a runway still before these funds are actually uh, distributed out to counties. And, uh, and then they'll, that'll be happening on a rotating basis uh, every, you know, not exactly six months, but almost six months, there'll be another payment um, uh, issued from the Department of Revenue to go out to the counties and then for the counties to, to determine how they use. It is a five-year uh, uh, legislative authorization right now. And so part of what we're thinking about at the state is, you know, how do we make sure that with this investment, there's the kind of right kind of information to complement what we have learned about the impact of those dollars in a way that helps us uh, make the case for uh, sustaining, enhancing, refining, uh, whatever uh, would be necessary with those funds. For our collective purposes, really important to note that Homework Starts With Home was very clearly the, the motivation and legislative intent behind this, uh, this new program. So even though it works very differently in a lot of ways than the way Homework Starts With Home is structured, Homework Starts With Home was explicitly the, the, the reference point for the, the, uh, the language that got included in the tax omnibus bill. And uh, the second bullet on the right there, you can see that the, the language is really very specifically focused at student homelessness and, and child homelessness and helping families find and keep uh, stable housing. There is, as I said, a lot of local discretion and uh, there is a reporting expectation both for, from the Department of Revenue to the legislature and from counties to the Department of Revenue. So I wanna just dive just a little bit deeper into these uh, funding sources and, and perhaps I hope maybe get you all thinking about the ways in which 
these revenues also create partnership opportunities or, or you know, ways to, to use funds locally in ways that may be innovative and impactful. There is so much uh, breadth in the allowable purposes, but there are some specific things that are included in the legislation, which was referenced on, this, on the previous page. Um, so the, the funding can go to a broad range of entities after it's been received by the county. That could include county administered programs, but programs administered by almost any other entity, as you can see from that uh, long first bullet. Uh, there are some expectations that it's focused on pre-K uh, families with pre-K to 12th grade kids or unaccompanied youth. And so, uh, so an expectation that whatever gets funded with these dollars, uh, the counties have a plan for how they're going to target those two populations. Uh, there's an expectation around connecting people with services that will actually help meet uh, their housing stability needs and to either provide rental assistance or some kind of support and case management. So because this is a local government aid and because the counties get to decide how to spend these dollars, the role that we play at the state is different than the role that we play with other grant programs. And what we're really trying to do is essentially package up options and tools and templates and examples for how counties may wanna think about using these funds and making uh, the biggest impact they can with these resources. And so we've got an interagency team that is modeled very much after how we put together Homework Starts With Home that is really trying to, to help create a, a, a way for the state to be a good partner to county governments in deploying these dollars and would welcome your help. I think part of the thing that we, we feel like would be most successful with these dollars is for communities to be able to connect with each other about, hey, here's a really cool thing that we did in, in our neck of the woods that worked really well to engage students that we were otherwise having a hard time finding or engaging and uh, have other communities be able to benefit from that wisdom. We also know there is a huge opportunity for these funds to be channeled into existing programs. It's not does not have to be new programs that are set up with these dollars. And so this is also a really good time if you're in county government to be connecting with your local partners around what some of the opportunities might be for those programs to grow and expand with these dollars. Or if you're not within a county government, a good time to be connected to your county partners around that same question. Um, if you have information or materials that you'd like us to feature and highlight in the in the we're, going to put a web page on Minnesota Housing's site that really helps uh, create kind of a compendium of options and ideas for counties to consider. If you've got a, an example that you'd like us to include, uh, please email me and uh, we'd be happy to, to put it in the in the list of things. Um, I'm going to just pause there if it's okay, Aaron, for just a moment and just see if folks have any questions before I go on to the next piece. All right, well, uh, more to come on this. Uh, obviously a huge opportunity in terms of the magnitude of those funds and uh, very much aligned with the work that you're all doing every day with Homework Starts With Home. So thought that would be of, of interest. So then very quickly, what I wanted to do is also just take this chance as it's the first day of the legislative session to provide a little bit of background about what you probably heard last week with the announcement of the governor's budget and, um, and really to also situate that in a context. So uh, over the last year, the Interagency Council on Homelessness has really been rethinking and re-envisioning how it positions the work to prevent and end homelessness writ large and the state's role to prevent and end homelessness specifically as part of that, and really has shifted uh, our orientation to be thinking about those, those questions in the context of housing, racial, and health justice. And so you will notice, I think, in a lot of the work that happens across state programs and really at the, uh, at the enterprise or state government level as a whole, ways in which we are really uh, using this frame to, to, to organize and drive forward the, uh, the activities, the, the programs, the policies that we think state government can most uh, helpfully uh, support and impact uh, at a local level. And so that includes the, the Walls Flanagan budget to move Minnesota forward, which I, I guess I can't really stress enough, feels like it makes transformational and landmark levels of investment 
in our collective efforts to prevent and end homelessness and address housing stability writ large. Uh, this is a budget that I think includes kind of something for everyone who is interested in finding uh, uh, us making progress on, on uh, housing instability across our state. And uh, it's more than we can cover in the time that we have here, but I didn't wanna lose the opportunity to at least tease it. And again, with this QR code, give you a nice link to the handy uh, summary that goes into greater detail over nine pages of what's all included in this proposal. 35 specific line items, uh, including 19 that are brand new, a number of programs that are that represent uh, state agencies' first targeted homeless program investments being proposed in this budget. And when you look across all of those 35 items, over a billion dollars of spending over the next uh, three fiscal years. To give you a sense of what that represents relative to, to previous spending levels, our current spending across those same line items, this would be about a six-fold increase in those in that spending level. So really feels like the opportunity to have a, a transformational impact on our collective work to end homelessness. I'm not gonna go through all the details, but let me just hit a couple of important points. One is that um, across uh, the these proposals, we really are kind of seeing state investments hit gaps that have never been filled before. Uh, the investment right at the top of this screen for creating the uh, emergency shelter facility grant program that would actually help uh, invest in the capital needed to stand up additional shelters uh, as just an example of that. Really important investments in the services side of that as well with the emergency services program. Uh, across DPS and MDH and MDHR, brand new programming that are designed to, to really reach uh, populations that those agencies serve and support that don't have any existing precedent right now. And then important investments at MDVA to sustain the work on veteran homelessness. And then at Minnesota Housing, in addition to a historic uh, request for uh, housing infrastructure and general obligating bonds, general obligation bonds, uh, a, a really, really targeted investments, including uh, a $30 million proposed investment to expand Homework Starts With Home and broaden the focus of Homework Starts With Home to also include kids prenatal to pre-K. So uh, this is kind of the governor and lieutenant governor offering up a vision of what is possible with Minnesota's current uh, financial position and the opportunities that we have right now. It is obviously now up to the legislature uh, and advocates to help the legislature understand the impact of, of what these investments would mean. So uh, forgive me for, for using the opportunity to tease what for us was a very exciting announcement on the part of state government, but I hope it's of interest to you too. And I hope you see the work that you're doing every day honored and lifted up in these proposals. So thanks, Aaron, back to you. Thanks, Eric, and Commissioner Ho this morning um, encouraged everyone's advocacy to make this this a reality and make uh, this investment come true to um, serve our community. Uh, passing it off to Lee from M MDE to share more resources. MDE, yes, that's a tough act to follow, Eric. Um, Thank you for that update and just very, very exciting information. Um, my name is Lee Slisher and I'm here to very happy to provide an update from uh, the Department of Education. And um, specifically, I wanted to highlight that I work in a division called the Division of Student Access and Opportunity. And so I'm speaking very much from my perspective uh, from within uh, our division and wanted to highlight um, a few different things that we have in, that we work with directly in my division. One is that you've probably heard of is the McKinney Vento subgrant program, and that program reaches about 18 of the state's uh, school districts with the highest numbers and highest percentages of students experiencing homelessness. And our program coordinator for that program is Roberto Reyes. That program has been in existence for a long time, and it's about $800,000 that flow directly to school districts um, on an annual basis. The second uh, piece in our division is uh, comes with the Title I Part A program, 
And that is part of the largest of the federally funded programs under the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, states get money based on free and reduced lunch, you know, uh, basically census poverty data. And then the programs are administered um, based on, on improving academic, uh, academic skills and, and um, supports for students. There is a specific set aside requirement in Title I Part A for homeless education. And that's really important because I think almost all except for maybe three of our um, districts and charter schools receive Title I Part A in Minnesota. So that's over 500 um, school districts and you know traditional school districts and charter schools that have that requirement to um, and I'll outline some of some of that in, in just a minute. Um, you know, provide uh, some support for students experiencing homelessness. Um, a new program that I'll spend most of the time talking about today is money that came to Minnesota under the American Rescue Plan, um, specifically earmarked for homeless children and youth. Um, that program has expanded our reach of only 18 McKinney Vento subgrantees to under uh, one piece of the funding. We have about 160 um, subgrantees receiving funding under this new um, program funded funded with the American Rescue Plan funds. And so that is a significant opportunity for us. And I'm going to get into a little few more specifics. And then, of course, there's the other what $129 billion that has flowed to education um, under you know, the various stimulus um, pots of, of funding. And, and we have a, a specific coordinator, um, John Ford coordinates uh, most of that programming. But you know, homeless students, children and youth are across all programs in all schools and districts in Minnesota. And so it's certainly a very um, an, an important piece when we look at resources for um, what we are talking about today. I really want to point out, however, that I'm, I'm speaking from the context of my division and of course, um, you know, across divisions at MDE, early learning, Indian education, college and career readiness, school um, support, special education, our charter school division are all working, um, you know, with homeless children and youth in mind, uh, but I'm just highlighting a few of the programs. And I see Beth Leckler has joined us, and so I just wanted to take a moment to introduce Beth as our new um, grant program coordinator under the American Rescue Plan grant. And um, this is, I think it's week three for Beth and she hasn't left yet, so we're good. And just very happy to have Beth join us and hope that each of you will get an opportunity to get to know her as we as we move along. Um, yeah, so I did want to highlight just a few of the requirements uh, for in the Title I Part A subgrant, first of all. Um, and that is that uh, any uh, identified homeless student is automatically eligible for Title I. Um, those of you familiar with that program know that there's kind of a, a, a method for serving different schools, but regardless of any um, of where that student attends, um, that is uh, to be provided uh, with Title I dollars and um, that can come along with transportation and and other various um, supports. Another important piece under Title I is that each school district must name a homeless liaison. And so we have a name um, for each of our school districts in a database that we call MDE.org. And when I send you out the PowerPoint, you'll have this live link but um, if you're curious, you can, you know, this is definitely searchable. There are contact lists and district homeless liaison is one of the, the contacts. And um, so that is a resource that I'd encourage you to share with your partners is that, you know, there should be a contact in each of the school districts. That is a requirement. Um, school districts update this database. MDE does not. And so part of our work is to always, you know, pitch, you know, making sure that this information is updated, but this is the most up to date um, list of 
school homeless liaisons that you that you will find. So wanted to point that out. Um, and you know, here just highlighting just some of the some of the things that um, the the homeless set aside in Title One can and should be used for. And um, you know, certainly we work in the context of that program with districts, particularly in rural Minnesota, with high free reduced lunch numbers, but according to our education data, have low numbers of identified um, children and youth to make sure that, you know, the there are no barriers to identifying students in that district, school districts understand, because we know that there's a high correlation between free reduced price lunch and numbers of uh, homeless children and youth. So wanted to point that out. Now, the new program, the switching gears, this is the new ARP HCY program that I am uh, talking about. So what that means for Minnesota is $8,655,053 in new funding um, to be dedicated to homeless children and youth. And you remember, remember me, recall me saying that um, the McKinney-Vento subgrant was about 800,000, and so this is over 8 million. So there's a pretty significant uh, piece in our state. This funding, that the whole 8 million is available to states and to school districts until September 30th, 2024. So it has that three-year lifespan. And um, there were some statutorily required pieces in terms of how this money um, flows out to school districts. The first piece was to be used immediate to immediate uses um, last July, last spring, I should say, um, and was distributed to those 18 McKinney-Vento subgrantees. So in conjunction with that program, it was like an, an extra supplemental chunk and it could be used for some specific pieces, but also any of the traditional uses of the McKinney Vento funding. Um, I think I warned some of you that at 3.30 my kids come home, so you are hearing noises. Um, the second largest piece is um, is going is being distributed along a for, formula lines to the approximately 160 districts that I mentioned, just you know, traditional school districts and charter schools. And um, and and this is the pro program that Beth is working most closely with right now to to manage those funds, and um, but and so we are working on on getting those that funding out the door and and making sure that it is utilized uh, in a way that is you know both compliant and strategic and. Um, in alignment with all of the many partnerships that we have going on. And then also there is a piece set aside for state activities and um, states were allowed to set aside up to 25% of the total award and um, to support activities through the office of the state coordinator for, for homeless education. And I'll mention that in a moment. And so I'm not going to go through all of this particularly, but you know, in general, targeting needs of homeless children and youth caused by the pandemic is is what they, these this funding can be can be used for, um, and that includes, you know, wraparound services, um, mental health, social and emotional health needs, and and such. Um, that can be, you know, we attribute back to um, the pandemic. Um, we've done some training with districts around, you know, what are wraparound services? What can this, what can this look like? Um, um, some of the typical stuff, you know, enrichment programs, programs that engage and re-engage students and families in school. Um, very big push by USDE is to work with existing community based organizations in providing services. And so we are talking with districts about, you know, contracting community based organizations in their in their area who are already well positioned to to do the work to 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 do a lot of the um, connection that that 
is needed in supporting kids with wraparound services and family families. And also a big emphasis on um, targeting historically underserved populations within um, within this program. Um, I did just kind of these. All of the things on the next three slides are just kind of the laundry list of things that McKinney Vento funding can be used for. Um, so it's all of those things and you know needs that are directly related to the pandemic. Um, I mentioned earlier, so the first part of the money that smaller that smaller piece went out um, to the existing McKinney Vento sub grantees targeting immediate needs. And the the larger program going out to the approximately 160 districts. Um, targeting those ongoing needs. There was a floor of $5,000. Districts must generate at least $5,000 to be eligible. Some of our districts formed consortia. And I think we have nine uh, consortia functioning that, you know, they pulled in others around to be able to come up with that at least $5,000 threshold and, and take part in the program. Um, so the 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 um, the awards range from that low of 5,000 up to about 300,000 is I think our, our largest award. Now we were very specific working with Aaron and Nancy and Diane in connecting Homework starts with home and the FHPHP subgrantees in our application. And what you're looking at is that actually a question that we asked in the in the application for the funding to the to the school districts. You know, we asked them, is your district a partner of a current or pending homework starts with because at the time they were pending a home grant? If yes, describe the LEA's role in the partnership and describe how the LEA will use this funding to strengthen that partnership. And then we ask the same question for the FHPAP um, fundee, uh, grantees. And as Beth is now going through applications, we intend to use this as a baseline and sharing information in, um, you know, having that narrative description of from the school district's perspective, what what is that partnership? And so just as a as a lever, as a way into connecting um, with the work that you are doing. So I really wanted to point that out. We gave them your contact information too, by the way. Um, another quick word about the you know statewide support. So all states had to submit a state plan. Ours is submitted. It's out there on a USDE website and um, it was approved. And um, so you'll see details of the state plan and then the subgrantee plans as well in that state plan. Again, we worked with um, you know, folks across agencies, especially at housing, in and were very helpful in helping uh, MDE to, to create that plan with those alignments to the interagency work that that Eric mentioned to your specific program and just to support and coordinate um, and and to, to be useful, useful partners. And so you'll see, you know, highlighted there, you know, development. Uh, we would, MDE is very interested in further development of um, state and local partnerships with state and local service providers, you know, continuing to provide more and better technical information to school districts around um, homeless children and youth and in education and in housing and in all of the areas of wraparound supports that are needed. And you know, just hoping to build our capacity at the state level with with that funding. Um, kind of next steps where we're at is just providing that ongoing funding for L uh, support, I should say, for LEAs, and um, focus, and then focusing in, really focusing in on what the community-based organization piece can look like, and what opportunities there are there. And so also at the end, I gave you some resources in the presentation, which I will send out. And that's what I wanted to update you with today for from MDE. 335, wow, okay, did, did well. Um, I could take a moment for questions or Beth, I'm, I'm not sure, I kind of rambled all the way through that and wondering maybe if you wanted to highlight or add anything there. 
Um, I mean, the, you did a great job. There's there's so many things going on um, in in the general di right direction. Um, I just I think I just want to say that um, I want to thank Lee for doing a great job of positioning MDE in a way where we are really encouraging the districts to, you know, think big, um, reach out to local partners and advocate for that as much as we can. Um, one observation that I would make at this very early day 15 stage in my game here um, is that identification uh, continually comes up. Identifying youth who are experiencing homelessness is a challenge for the districts who are doing so many other things. And um, so I, I believe that they, um, they need help. Um, and that they're probably willing to do um, more if they if they can. So um, as excited as I am to be supporting the districts, I also have a background in interagency collaborations. So I'm really just thrilled to be starting at this time with uh, so many exciting things happening. Um, learning a lot from Lee and looking forward to working with all of you. Erin, I just had a quick question for Lee. Um, you mentioned earlier the that each school district had a homeless liaison. Do you feel like that would be the best person to reach out to to find out um, if their school district has received some of these additional funds or started any new programs that they might be interested in connecting with? Yes, I, I do think that as a first step, um, the um, the homeless liaison, um, kind of the the perfect trio is the homeless liaison, the superintendent, and the business manager. Because we find, and you'll find a contact collection for each of those. We find that often, you know, they each have a different perspective. But certainly, um, cer Luca, please. Um, certainly, the homeless liaison would would be a great contact. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, Lee and Beth and, and Eric for sharing all of these, these resources and um, current and, and potential um, resources that we have to, to partner with uh, Homework Starts With Home. We um, think with our conference's theme of opportunities at the intersection of housing and another uh, sector. I think um, this program really exemplifies how partnerships really um, make the difference and, and creates a bigger impact and the partnership with with uh, Department of Education is really important in, in the success of this program. Um, so thank you all for for sharing and giving some updates and we'll make sure we get those um, additional PowerPoints to uh, you all. OK. Moving on from resources here, uh, I wanted to take some time. Most of you have seen this timeline of the of the lifespan of homework starts with home, but I uh, this is I know there's a lot of folks who maybe aren't uh, aren't direct grantees that are part of this call today. And, and since we have separate and overlapping funding round cohorts um, that are attempting to come together as as one learning collaborative and will eventually align timeframes. I wanted to give a brief overview um, of each of the cohorts and kind of talk through uh, the players uh, and share some lessons learned along the way. Particularly we're, we're approaching, you know, almost this this 10 year marker or what are we at eight year eight and I don't know what that is in like grant lives, but I feel like we're kind of in like the awkward teenage years of this program. Um, it is, you know, a relatively new program and we um, are learning a, a lot along the way. So I wanted to share a few tidbits with you. So Homework Starts with Home was born out of the pilot called the Homeless and Highly Mobile Pilot. Uh, consisting of three grantees and um, there's a lot of people on this call actually who are, were there from the beginning so make sure you chime in and let me know if I misspeak here at all but we started with Clay County uh, PPL a uh, project for pride and living uh, in a NAS project uh, northern north side achievement zone I believe uh, and Wilder and together with the University of Minnesota Minlink the Minnesota Department of Education 
and, and of course Minnesota Housing, the homework starts with home research partnership was designed and implemented, designed and implemented in the evaluation of the program homework starts with home. The University of Minnesota Grand Challenge Initiative awarded funding to study the pilot program of Homework Stars with Home, uh, the pilot as well as the, the round one program participants. And this collaborative state university school community project is an extraordinary opportunity to align university expertise with the interagency state initiative. This a uh, project is designed to integrate and analyze multi-system administrative data to produce high quality evidence pertinent to addressing the state and national challenge of student homelessness. Project outcomes are collectively aimed at eliminating the threat of homelessness and helping support educational success for homeless students. And we'll check in with Dr. Ann Mastin, uh, co-director of the Homework Starts with Home partnership on the status of this research uh, later on. Uh, in our conversation. Because of the success of the model, the pilot project, Homework Starts with Home was launched in 2018 with one-time funding from the Minnesota Legislature. So in this round, we continued the, the three original uh, pilot uh, members, Clay County, Wilder, and PPL, and added uh, BICAP and Lutheran Social Services uh, with a uh, primary service provider of solid ground. So round one grantees are also included in that research partnership, as I mentioned. Um, and it started in October 2018 and was scheduled to end this past September. However, due to COVID, four of the five participants um, have extended their contracts additional six months. So we're now ending March 31st, 2022, and Clay County had continued funding through through round two. So you know, we'll uh, mention throughout uh, round one and round two the the real effects of uh, COVID had on uh, funding uh, and the ability to get funds out the door. So here I wanted to show kind of how the funding uh, was uh, structured in this first round. Um, we had $4.1 million uh, to spend. Sorry, I'm going to back up and share a few things about um, the pilot and the round one that I wanted to mention. Um, so pilot was $4 million over um, over the span of four, almost four years to serve uh, 277 families. And round one of the actual program homework starts with home is four point one five million dollars from three sources. So it's uh, FHPAP uh, housing trust fund as well as philanthropy dollars with the target to serve two hundred and thirty nine households. So I wanted to note that there is a an actual decrease in funding as we move forward. And in this first round, the the amounts of the amount of dollars were designated. So there was an, an amount that had to be from housing trust fund um, and an amount uh, for FHPAP. So the lion's share was the 3.5 of the 4.15 into the housing trust fund. So the actual rent assistance portions and the rest is primarily services from philanthropy and FHPAP. <clears throat> And as of uh, September, the total grant is about 80% spent um, and the, the service portions of philanthropy portions are mostly spent at this point. So I just wanted to point that out because kind of as there uh, became some flexibility in how the funds were structured, there's a shift in, in um, the balance between Housing Trust Fund and uh, FHPAP. So round two of Homework Starts with Home uh, started in August 1st of 2020. So obviously in, in the throes of COVID and will be uh, ending September 30th of 2023. So this is a kind of an odd timing a grant. It's 38 months, so a three plus year grant, which the previous was uh, three years or three in, in a quarter. So kind of have um, flexible grant terms uh, in this program. And by this round, by round two, um, Homework Starts with Home has its own appropriation. However, no statute at, at this point. So it continues to fall under the guidance and funding mechanisms of both FHPAP and Housing Trust Fund. And the recipients of uh, this grant uh, were 
Clay County, um, which is the only only uh, pullover from previous rounds. And so we welcomed Hennepin County, Red Lake Homeless Shelter and Three Rivers Community Action. Uh, this in this round resources were offered for planning and um, were also offered in planning uh, to plan to be an applicant for future uh, rounds in recognition that uh, developing a collaborative grant does require a lot of community engagement and strategizing prior to the application. So we did fund three planning grant re uh, recipients. Um, for resources to engage in the planning uh, for a one year time frame. And from this group, there was one uh, recipient that applied in round three, uh, one that anticipates a applied in a future round, and one that determined that it, Homework Starts at Home was not a, a great fit for their organization. As I mentioned here, we. Uh, see a shift in kind of how the funds um, were designated. And so the applicants and the, the grantees were able to determine uh, what portion of FHPAP or housing trust fund they want in their um, grant proposals. And this is, they're just a, a few, few quarters in, uh, begin, but again, this kind of continues a trend of uh, the grants having uh, some ramp up in their programming, so the spending doesn't uh, start off uh, right off the bat. Um, and as we um, go to round three that just started, we have been able to, I think I missed a slide in here. So all of our um, round three recipients um, are, are have been uh, recipients in previous rounds. We have BICAP, we have Hennepin County, and we have the LSS Solid Ground. And But each of these have been an expansion of their previous projects. So into different counties or into different school uh, systems targeted for um, the most need in their communities. So I just wanted to point out again that um, you know we're having overlapping uh, funding rounds and we're eventually getting to a point where we're going to need to um, have one funding round. So the competition is going to be uh, more competitive and we are um, now at no additional uh, last two rounds. Uh, actually, we've had no additional philanthropy funds, so it has been just uh, FHPAP and Housing Trust Fund. And in round two, there was a little additional um, recaptured funds that we were able to to put into the pot, um, but we are now still at our at our only at our appropriation of 3.5 million to be able to to share in a competitive round. Um, so good thing we have more resources uh, coming from local aid and and hopefully through the governor's budget. Aaron, it's also interesting to me that, you know, we started with 4 million serving 277 households and then um, went down to 3.5 million serving 324 households. Or it's almost like we're trying to do more with less in some ways, um, but also probably refining our our practices and learning from those so that we're able to maximize those funds to the greatest extent possible as well. Absolutely, I think we're definitely seeing that trend in our numbers. Um, so again, here we'll see that that uh, round three also kind of has a similar when when there's the option to determine what funding source is best for their collaborative. There is more of uh, a need for services um, that are represented in these charts here. And to Diane's point, here's a, a snapshot of the the numbers. Um, from federal, federal fiscal year 20 and 21. So um, for federal fiscal year 20, this would be only households that were served through uh, round one uh, program participants. And 2021 would uh, in, include uh, some from round two as well, but uh, exactly right. There is um, more money needed to serve fewer households. 
um, from 2020 to 21, and that, that's a trend that I'm seeing in housing trust fund as well. I think it may be an interesting difference that I'm um, that is unique to homework starts with home that I'm, I'm not seeing in housing trust fund is that the median income is is increasing and perhaps that's the shift with the towards uh, FHPAP and serving people who are maybe not uh, meeting that high priority homeless definition. But it's the, the only stat that I've seen far where there's an increase in the annual income of household serves, which is still incredibly incredibly low. And historically, homework starts with home has served a high proportion of households of, of color, black indigenous households of color. Oh, here's my my slide out of order. So I think I've um, mentioned everything I want to say here about round three. Um, Uh, one more thing I, w I wanted to to say, um, you know, it, it does, you know, to Diane's point of, you know, there's less dollars um, and and more families, but I think some sometimes there's that increase in households due to serving those those FHPAP households or maybe um, a shorter term, um, but but I think what we're learning kind of across the board, if we're serving the the target of this program, which is you know, more the the harder to serve households, the high priority homeless, that it is really taking um, more time to stabilize them. They haven't been able to transition off during uh, this pandemic. Um, and it's really taking um, a more as far as rental assistance to keep them to to get them in housing and to keep them in housing. Um, there was some, uh, you know, with with the a, a front uh, front end of the grant and the end end of the grant with no guarantee of funding um, future rounds, we have been um, encouraging grantees to to think about a ramp down of the program. I mean, we always do hope that your your program is able to continue for future funding, but that is something that we definitely want to encourage. There isn't a, uh, you know, three year time limit or a two year time limit. The 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 time limit uh, max uh, aligns with the housing trust fund max of, you know, no more than five years of rent assistance, but we do um, encourage um, grantees to think about um, the fact that there may not be funding next rounds. So I did want to um, let Dr. Ann Mastin uh, speak about the Homework Starts with Home Research Partnership. Um, Ann is the Regents profession, Professor of Child Development at the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota um, and the co-director of the, the research partnership. So I wanted to just uh, let her share a few words about um, the work with the pilot and round one grantees. Okay, thank you, Erin. And I see you've posted the link there in your slide to the some uh, our website, which is called Ending Student Homelessness. And in there, you will find uh, a vid video recording of a conference we held, and we'll, you'll see some of the you can find some of the research briefs in there and get an overview of what we're up to. I will be brief today because I know it's been a long day and I'm not using slides. Some of you will be happy to hear. Um, and I just wanna hit a few highlights of what we're up to in the research partnership. This is a group of um, researchers from the University of Minnesota part teaming up and partnering with uh, various people from state agencies and from the community um, Eric and Aaron and Nancy, who are, have been on this um, conference call, are, are involved in this, as well as folks from MDE, like Joe Curiel, and a number of wonderful researchers across the university, both faculty and students. And we formed be because we wanted to try to do, provide evidence about the success of programs like Homework Starts With Home and see what we could do to demonstrate the value of integrating data uh, using the Minnesota Information Linking System for Kids or MinLink 
And what we could do to put together the data that would document what was being accomplished it, with the idea that this would inform and guide and uh, facilitate the uh, continued funding and the policy making at, at the state level. And this was funded by a grand challenge award from the University of Minnesota. So all the research to date has been funded by the university. Uh, we'll run out of funding at some point here, and then we'll need to find other sources of funding to keep going. But I think we're going to be able to show the power of this kind of research partnership. And I just want to share a few uh, accomplishments to date. As Erin mentioned, we focused our research on the initial recipients of the grants um, in this program, both the pilot and then we'll also be adding in the data from the initial cohort one. And it's really quite an accomplishment to integrate data. We're, we're pulling together data from, from millions of students and their families uh, across 71 different kinds of data sets, uh, multiple agencies pulling the data together in, a, in, in MinLink. And MinLink is an extremely secure data analysis system. And what we've done so far is, first of all, you know, get all of the agreements together to do this, but then we've put the data together for the initial rounds and we've identified both the recipients of the rental assistance programs and then a very, very closely matched comparison group, which provides us with an opportunity to analyze like a, almost like an experiment, a quasi experimental design. So we can compare what was the impact of the intervention of rental assistance compared to uh, families who didn't receive that. And we've begun the initial analyses, and you can see some of those data if you go to our website. But I just wanted to highlight a few things and talk briefly about what I see as possibilities in the future that are very exciting. First of all, we, we demonstrated already, I think, that it's feasible to use MinLink to do this. It's, um, you know, it's complex, but they've set up a really wonderful system. And it, it's been fantastic to have the expertise from Minnesota Housing and the Interagency Council and MDE to understand the data that we're putting together. And one of the things, one of the first things we learned that the data show clearly is who was reached by the pilot programs. Um, you know, the, the programs did reach families of students at very high risk of homelessness, and we can show that in the integrated data. They, as Aaron showed you a moment ago, they're disproportionately um, minoritized populations that are overrepresented among folks at high risk for homelessness. And in particular, the early rounds, because two of the recipient programs were in the Twin Cities, they were disproportionately African-American, about 80% of those recipients. There were also, um, we could show that we, we got integrated data, not only from the present, but we went backwards in time, which is you can do with this kind of administrative data. And we're able to show that the recipients had a history of very high risk for homelessness as well as current risk for insta housing instability. They have all the indicators you might imagine of poverty and the kids, the students um, were, had a history of overall of low attendance compared to other kids um, from the same background and higher suspension rates and higher school mobility and also higher uh, child protection involvement, which often goes along with family instability. So far, we know from the results that rental assistance was associated with a decrease in shelter stays, which you would hope for to be able to show that right away, as well as a decline in school mobility. Again, those are good short-term indicators of impact. It's too early to tell whether the stabilization of the families related to rental assistance and the students um, has had an impact on their learning. And I, there's two reasons for that. One is that there's all, when you use administrative data like this, there's always a bit of a lag, you know, you know and during the pandemic, there was even more of a lag in, put, in, in retrieving 
administrative data. But that's why we want, we're going, that's one of our goals this spring is to see how far we can go to look at the outcomes of these programs. We also did a lot of training. We had a great team of graduate students who worked on these kind of data and they, they also had very interesting findings, which you we're still adding their reports, but the, you'll see them on our website if you're interested. And one of the things I think we're, I'm very excited about for the future is we've laid the groundwork and pulled together the baseline data. So we should be, if we keep going, we should be able to study, for example, whether rental assistance protected families during the pandemic, to what degree that happened. We also should be able to understand how eviction fits into the story and look at longer term, you know, change over time. Do, did students who received this rental assistance, did they end up showing a different pattern of attendance over, over time, not just in the short term, but over a longer period of time. So this whole team is very excited about what we may be able to do. And I think we've shown that a partnership like this really can produce high quality work. And I'll just see if uh, Eric or Aaron want to add anything to that. Or that is a great summary, Anne. <laughs> Thank you for your partnership and sharing an, an update on the, the research. Um, and thank you all for, for being a part of uh, our conference and this Homework Starts With Home session. It was a, an overview and a lot of information uh, in this hour and this whole day, but we really appreciate your, your partnership. Um, and we hope that you join us tomorrow for day two of the, the Minnesota Housing Joint Conference, Joint Grants Conference. Any any words or questions? We can. I see I see videos popping up, so I'm curious if there's some questions out there. Or just wanted to wave goodbye. <laughs> awesome, lovely to see your faces. Thank you all for your work and all you do. Thanks for waving, everyone. <laughs> nice. Have a good afternoon.